Professional Center. I am grateful that you have joined us today as well. Um, today is a bit, uh, today was a bit rainy in the morning and it's a bit gloomy, but I am very happy that you are here with me to listen to actually my talk today. As you have heard last time, some of you who were actually present, we had a bit of, um, unfortunate situation where due to an emergency our last week's speaker couldn't join us so last week's GIC talk was unfortunately cancelled in the end even though we uh, tried our best to make it happen and those of you who were here last time might as well remember that I really wanted to uh, share my talk with you but Fortunately or unfortunately, what happened afterwards is that, I'm saying fortunately for me because I wanted to share my talk with you anyway, but unfortunately for what we have planned, our speaker this week also due to a personal emergency could not come. So there came the chance for me to do my talk, which I really hoped to share with you. So. Once again, I will introduce myself and then I will start my talk today. It's quite interesting. I feel like I'm talking to myself today since I am the host and the speaker, but I really hope that you will not be bored since I will be the only face you will, you will be seeing today. I hope you will enjoy my talk. Let me share the screen and then I will start. Let's see, let's see, share this screen. Oops, not this one. I'm not the best because usually I am just the host, not actually the presenter. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. So the topic of my talk is connecting cultures, discovering similarities and differences between Serbia and Korea. That is what I shall be talking about today. And one very, very interesting thing is that, at least for me, today, four years ago, on this very day, I actually boarded the plane from Serbia to Korea for the first time. So even though my actual four year anniversary in Korea is tomorrow because it took me, yes, it took me a whole day to get from Serbia to Korea. Um, the actual anniversary of me leaving Serbia is today, four years ago today. So just a bit more about me. As I just mentioned, I came to Korea four years ago. I came as a scholarship, um, one of the scholarship students, uh, the scholarship that is provided by the National Institute of International Education of Korea. And that scholarship is for um, doing the graduate school, doing the master's degree in Korea. So after I graduated my university, after I graduated in Serbia, immediately upon graduation, basically it wasn't even three months after graduation when I boarded that plane and came to Korea. And before coming to Korea, I didn't know a single word of Korean so what first uh, what I had to do first was to learn Korean so I had my uh, language year learning Korean one year of language learning in Guangzhou so the first place where I came from the Incheon airport was right here Guangzhou and I did my uh, language year for a year at Tannam National University Language Education Center, which was a really, really amazing place, I have to add. Then after that, for two years, I went to Seoul, to Hongbuk University, and uh, that is where I did the master's degree in cultural contents. And again, immediately upon graduation, because honestly, I loved Guangzhou more than Seoul, I came back from Seoul to Guangzhou, right here, and I started my internship again right here at Guangzhou International Center exactly a year ago right and after a whole year of internship at GIC 
I can even brag a bit right now. After a whole year of the internship here, I became a full-time employed coordinator of GIC, and that is how I will be here for a while for the future now. Now, coming back to my topic, that was, I don't know if you were ever actually curious to learn a bit more about me because I'm always here as the face presenting the talks, but today I'm also the speaker. So what I would like to talk about today is um, something that I've learned after coming here, and that is that connecting cultures is really not as difficult as some may seem. Just simple words, simple talking to people and seeing, oh, this is the same in my country as in your country. Oh, this is different in my country and it's different here. Just talking to people and understanding is way more simple than people sometimes make it out to be. So my talk today won't be anything super, super professional or um, with many research and um, other like academic journals quoted. No, this will be a very, very, very personal story. So speaking of personal story, yes, let's take a look what I will actually be talking about today. So first, very, very short opening, and I will focus on culture and tradition, language, everyday life, and then uh, after we um, after I finish, we can also have either a discussion all together or a Q&A, depends on how the mood today goes. Now, let's see. Uh, usually people are not really in the mood for uh, a lot of uh, interaction, but the first question that I would like to ask is, what comes to your mind when someone mentions Serbia? If there is anyone who would like to unmute themselves or, and say something, or maybe you can type it out in the chat room. I can't see the chat room at the moment, but we'll see. All right, so it's okay to be shy. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Now, next slide is uh, are actually some of the most common answers that, oh, wait, there is something in the chat room. Oh, Barbers of Serbia, it's an opera, a meat pie. Oh, okay, very famous. Okay, abroad, yes. Okay, those are a bit unusual answers. The usual answers that I get are, unfortunately, something else is coming up here. Dokovic, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Actually, the first response I usually get is World War One, which is most people learn, obviously, at school about World War One. And yes, the spark that ignited World War One uh, happened in, um, in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, but the person who did it <laughs> was actually a Serbian person, so a lot of people uh, connect Serbia with World War I. Mm -hmm. Next, people usually also think of Yugoslavia, yeah. which got in, and they also think about President Tito, who was very famous. Yes, I think I got this in the chat. The next person, Nikola Tesla, very, very important. And nightlife, Serbia is known for a uh, good nightlife and Novak Djokovic. I don't know if someone yeah. said in the chat room Novak Djokovic, all Bosnia had to go in a war, Nikola Tesla. Yes. So all of these are coming up now. I will mention a bit of these briefly, but I won't focus on any of those uh, of these topics today. I said I will be focusing on culture and tradition. So the next thing you will see, I just don't know why my going so slow. The next thing you will see is actually a short animation of the animation starts. The animation is not starting. Computer is going against me today. So what I wanted to show was the animation of how this is when in the Balkan Peninsula was changing since the creation of Yugoslavia and then as Yugoslavia was falling apart you unfortunately can't see the animation yeah it's not moving but you can see here in the key on the side how the countries that were that belonged to this big country Yugoslavia which was most famous by its president Tito 
were during the unfortunate events and many, many wars, how this was all changing. So what I can also tell you is that the country that I was born in was not Yugoslavia, but it was also not Serbia. It was Serbia and Montenegro. But then suddenly, in, because I was born in 1994, if you look at the, the key here, but then suddenly in 2006, Montenegro and Serbia got separated. So now there is only Serbia left. As you can see on the next slide, I'm really sorry. I don't know why the slides are moving so weirdly. So this, what you can see is the shape, the territory of Serbia today. Wow. One disclaimer I would like to make now is I did mention the uh, Yugoslavia and I just did briefly mention the wars and everything that was happening. But since most of this was very recent history, not to mention that I'm not really good at history. And when I talk about it, I'm really biased. And uh, I don't like to talk about politics. And this was all very, very recent. And it affected my childhood, actually. Because yes, yeah, some of these wars were happening while I was alive and very young. So I hope you can understand that I would like to leave that part out of my talk today and just not talk about it. The last thing connected to politics that I will say is probably something that you can mention here on the note. That is that Serbia does not recognize the statehood of Kosovo, which declared independence in 2008. It is like this until very day, as far as I know. And again, the last thing that I will say, honestly, in my heart, I also cannot accept it as a Serbian person due to what happened when I was young and due to some other historical circumstances but finally I would really hope if you could understand that I will leave out the political part and all of the war talk out of my talk today. Now what I would like to focus on, I really don't know why the PPT is not moving, is connecting Serbia and Korea. As you can see on the map, the total distance between Serbia and Korea is 8,461 kilometers. Exactly this distance is how much I miss my family at the moment. And not at the moment, I miss them all the time this much. So yes, it's really far. People ask me many times, is there a direct flight? No, there is no direct flight. So whenever I fly home, it takes, I think, at least 18 hours with the minimum transfer. You know, minimum transfer time should be around two hours. So yes, it takes a lot for me to go home. Now, let's take a look at... Serbia and Korea. As you can see, just by the name, both of the countries are republics, not to mention that looking at the colors of the flag, we have exactly the same colors. But one thing that I'm always very jealous, so to say, of, of my Korean friends is that um, easy to draw a Korean flag if you want to draw it. Now look at our look at our flag. Imagine how much it would take me to to draw this two-headed eagle. Yes. <laughs> now this was a bit of a joke, but comparing the size and the population, actually Korea is bigger. South Korea is bigger than Serbia but not by a lot. So if we just look at the size of the land, it would be, you can say similar. Korea is like, I say 1.3 times bigger than Serbia. But if we take a look at these numbers down here, population, this is Korea's population of, I think quite a while back. I think there's like, a bit more people now in South Korea, Serbia not a bit more than this, but yes, the population of South Korea is more than 50 million and the population of Serbia is around 7 million, so yes, my whole country has less population than only Seoul in South Korea, so that is something to be considered living on the on the same size of land yes and of course the capital of south korea so as we all know and the capital of serbia is belgrade 
This is the old part of Belgrade. I will talk a bit about Belgrade in a minute. And this is the old part of Seoul, right? Isn't it similar? Maybe not, I don't know. And now this image is the new part of Belgrade. And this is, let's say, a new, new view, a new, a bit like new buildings in Seoul. So maybe there can be a similar vibe here, maybe just because both of the cities are capitals. Now, coming back again to uh, the position of Serbia, actually, Serbia is in the heart of the Balkan Peninsula, literally in the heart. As you can see, Serbia is all surrounded by land, only there is no, uh, Serbia doesn't have like a um, direct way to see when we were Serbia and Montenegro, we did have it, but not anymore. So Serbia is actually surrounded by eight countries. So as a joke, when usually my Korean friends like to ask me, oh, how many countries did you travel to? Because, you know, everyone knows that in Europe, it's a bit easier to travel. And I say with a lot of confidence, well, to begin with eight. Well, I did. Surrounded by well, eight. It's really easy to travel, as you can now. see. Like, um, on the north, there's Hungary, then there is Romania, and one of our lovely colleague coordinators here is my neighbor from Romania. She also prepares this GIC talk with me. You can't see her because she's always off camera, but she's actually the mastermind behind this all. She's my neighbor. <laughs> when we look at the countries, then there's also Bulgaria, Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia Herzegovina, and Croatia. So. Did I mention Montenegro? I hope I didn't skip Montenegro because Montenegro is there as well. So yes, in total, eight countries surrounding my lovely Serbia. Now, I mentioned that the capital is um, Belgrade. Hello, neighbor. Yes, I get a hello from my, from my lovely, lovely Romanian neighbor. The capital of Serbia is Belgrade, but actually in Serbian it's uh, pronounced Beograd, and also in Korean, uh, in Korean it's pronounced Beograd. So yes, Korean's uh, Korean language has the original pronunciation of the of the capital city of Serbia, which is in English Belgrade, and Bel and Grad. Bel the part in front actually means white and grad, the, uh, the other and part means white. city. So Belgrade is really called white city and Belgrade was built on two rivers, on the confluence of two rivers. One of them is the Danube River, which is the second largest river in Europe. And the other one is um, Sava River. So because of its st a strategic position, Belgrade was always, always in many, many wars because everyone wanted to have such good strategic position, not to mention that Serbia itself being in the heart of the Balkan Peninsula is on the crossroads of all of the ways that lead from uh, the, the Orient, the Oriental part, Turkey, and to Europe. So everyone who wanted to go from Europe to um to the Middle East, they needed to go through Serbia and everyone other way around, everyone who wanted, let's say, from Turkey to go to Europe, they needed to go through Serbia. So basically, yes, my country was the ground of many, many wars. And Belgrade, which you see now, this is the Belgrade Fortress, a really, really beautiful fortress in Belgrade. Belgrade is one of the oldest cities in Europe, and this fortress is there to show many, many different, um, I'm going to say many different periods of history and many, many different nationalities that were there coming from like Romans and Celts. Celtic people and Slavs and then later the Turks and the uh, Austro-Hungarians. So every everyone who occupied Belgrade once in history left their mark here in this uh, fortress, which is why I really wanted to mention it. And coming back to wars and how interesting history Serbia has. I mean, I said I won't be talking about wars, but it somehow just comes up. 
actually Belgrade, because of this strategic position that I mentioned, was fought over in as many as 115 wars, 115 wars, and during this time, it was burned to the ground and rebuilt again around 44 times. So speaking of, of turbulent history, it has also changed the names, uh, the name many, many times, but as I said, the meaning white city. I'm still just introducing Serbia, but uh, that's about it, the short introduction. And now I will try to connect <laughs> Serbia and Korea through talking about culture and traditions. Let's take a look at this traditional instrument. The left one is the Serbian one, Usle, and the right one is the Korean instrument, Hikum. As you can see, they both look very, very similar. Both are string instruments. Both, both uh, use this, I realize I don't know how to call it, both are played like this. I don't know how you call this actual thing, the tool that you that you use to to play on it. And um, actually, when uh, I want to mention Gusle also because uh, singing to the accompany to the accompanying of Gusle is one of the intangible cultural heritage of Serbia inscribed in UNESCO. So it is. Um, a really great cultural treasure of Serbia, which we take great pride in. Now, since we talked about singing and instruments, it's time to talk about the traditional dance. On the left, we have Serbian traditional dance, which is kolo, and on the right, we have Korean traditional dance, one of, which is kangang sule. I hope I'm pronouncing it very well. Both of them are danced in a circle, you see, looking at these two pictures, they look very, very similar. One of the differences, however, that I realized after coming to Korea is that uh, Serbian people actually really like to dance kolo. We dance kolo even nowadays. So it is not just some random traditional dance that no one knows or that uh, we just go to the theater to watch. Actually, I believe that every party in Serbia in a way ends with <laughs> dancing kolo because it's really easy dance to begin with. Once upon a time, it was, you know, the they danced it on not only on fairs, but, you know, it was the place to socialize with people. Right. And that's how young boys and girls would meet dancing kolo back, back, back in the days. But nowadays, like even when we go to a party and where we have a big celebration or even at weddings, we still do actively dance kolo. And it's, it's not really it's really not a joke. So all the young people I know how to dance kolo literally every younger person also knows how to dance kolo. So I would say that I'm really happy and proud that we keep our tradition in that way. I really can't imagine of any celebration, big celebration now that would smoothly go in Serbia without someone jumping up and starting starting to dance kolo. Also, kolo was inscribed in the UNESCO traditional, uh, UNESCO intangible cultural heritage in I believe 2017. So yes, I believe I mentioned them all now. I will mention one more of our intangible cultural heritages a bit later on. Now probably the favorite part for everyone. Um, favorite part is talking about food. So as we know the staple food in most of Asia and in Korea as well is rice, whereas the staple food in Serbia is bread. So I can state that as a difference. But now I would like to talk about similarities that you may have not thought existed. This is sarma and kiseli kukus, which are the traditional foods of Serbia. What does it look like? What does it look like? Yes, you, if you guessed, I hope you guessed well. It looks like kimchi. Just look at this kiseli kukus here. It looks exactly like kimchi. And it tastes like that too, really. So one of the, one of the most famous questions whenever someone 
um, meets me for the first time here in Korea, because obviously kimchi is a really important part of Korean culture, everyone asked me, oh my god, can you eat kimchi? And I'm like, yes, I do eat kimchi, I love kimchi. And not only that, Serbian people, my country Serbia, has its own version of kimchi, and that is this kisili kupus and sarma as the most famous dish that is made with it. But one difference, one difference that I would like to mention is that um, we usually eat this only in winter. So, I mean, you can eat it throughout the year, but it's more, more popular in winter. So it's not like kimchi that it's, uh, how do you say, like, if there's no kimchi, I cannot eat. Well, now I've become a person like that also. But yes, kimchi is something very, very delicious for me since we have something very similar in my country. Next is a dish that is made with the, with the previous Sladek with the kupus that I just mentioned, and that is sladek kupus that looks and tastes, I don't know what's wrong with my presentation, looks and tastes exactly like kimchi jjigae. So that is the reason why one of my favorite foods here in Korea is kimchi jjigae. Maybe it doesn't look as appetizing or it doesn't look very same in these pictures. I did try to find representative pictures, but Trust me, the taste is very, very similar. I would say kimchi jjigae is a bit more spicy, but Serbian people also love to eat spicy food. So some people really like to add spice to their slada kupus. And just to, to add, it's not only me saying that once when my um, saying that slada kupus and kimchi jjigae are similar, once when my Korean friend came with me to Serbia, he actually tried the um slada kupus and and uh yes and he said oh my god this is kimchi i can't believe it this is kimchi so you have that proof from korean now as well in case you are <laughs> in case you are one of the koreans watching this next food that i would like to mention is actually like um i don't know how to say it, a spread I'm, I'm not going to call it a sauce and it's called aivar and what does it look like? What does it look like? Yes, it looks like gochujang. And the taste is very, very similar. Again, I can say that gochujang is probably a bit more spicy, but also with Aivar, we have the more spicy version of it and the milder version of it. So uh, the visual looks very, very similar. But one thing that will probably surprise uh, anyone, any listeners from Korea is that we put this Aivar, we put it on bread, we spread it, we use it as a spread and we put it on bread and mm, it's delicious. Oh my God, I really want to eat Aivar now when I'm talking about this. Uh, also, also one more thing that I would like to mention, um, as I said, the history of the Balkan Peninsula and what culturally and historically happened between the countries, uh, of course, impacted the fact that you can find uh, all of these similar dishes and similar culture in many other countries. So when I say that this is Serbian traditional dish, it's not exclusively and only existing in Serbia, in case you meet uh, friends from other Balkan countries who would say the very same for the dishes that I mentioned. Finally, last but not the least, last but not the least, oh my god, my PPT is going crazy again, is Serbian barbecue. Roštil. Serbian people love eating meat. So uh, barbecue and uh, Serbian barbecue and Korean barbecue as some gifts are, I cannot say that they're similar, but maybe I can say that the love that Koreans have for Samgyupsar is the same as the love Serbian people have for our roštil, our barbecue. So yes, I would really love if all of the Serbian people would, would try Samgyupsar and all of the Korean people would try roštil because I'm pretty sure that um, they would absolutely love it. So yes, that is another similarity in the food culture that I found. As you can see, way more similarities than you thought. Wait till you taste them. I hope you can taste them once. Speaking to all of my um, listeners from Korea, all of the participants from Korea. Moving on, it's also similar when we talk about 
holidays. Just look at this holiday feast. The right one is Chuseok and the, le the left one is Christmas. Now, um, when everyone thinks about Christmas, I'm pretty sure that you think of Christmas as a 25th December Christmas. However, uh, Serbia is a country of Orthodox Christians, so 85% of people, maybe even more, are Orthodox Christians, which means we follow the old traditional church calendar when we celebrate our holidays. So it's basically the same thing, the same thing in Korea. In Korea, when you live your daily life, you look at your normal calendar, right? But when you want to celebrate a, a holiday like Chuseok and Sarnar, you look at the lunar calendar. Exactly the same when it comes to Serbia. Everyday life, we use the normal calendar, as the whole the rest of the world uses but when it comes to uh, special holidays such as christmas and um, easter we look at the old church calendar so christmas in serbia is 7th of january so my first december christmas my first ever december christmas was when i when i came to korea and the christmas in serbia is um now again comparing and contrasting Christmas in Korea is a time to go out with your girlfriend or boyfriend and have a cake and maybe like have a party with your friends. And that was such a culture shock for me because Christmas in Serbia is more similar to Chuseok in Korea. Christmas in Serbia is a very, very traditional holiday when you are supposed to visit your parents. Like if you live in another city, you definitely go back to your parents' house. You take, you eat all of these traditional foods. And it's not really a day for dating and eating cake. As you can see, we have these um, many, many traditional dishes. And uh, oops. My PPT is going crazy today, I'm sorry. Uh, this tree that you can see on the left is called, it's, the, it's an oak tree, but we call it badnyak because it's a special tree that we burn on Christmas day. We um, traditionally, a man of the house would go to the forest and cut the tree and bring it into the house, but obviously no one lives near the forest anymore. So we just buy it in the market and uh, on, before Christmas, we bring it into the house and then on Christmas Day, we uh, burn it. That's one of the special traditions. And the picture you see on the right is uh, chesnitsa. So as you eat um, special, like you eat tokgu, right? You, you in Korea, everything made of rice is eaten specifically for holidays. Uh, as I said, uh, staple food in Serbia is bread. So we have a very, very special bread that we only, only, only eat on Christmas day. As you can see, it's um, usually a round shaped bread. It also, um, the shape and the, the recipe of the bread actually uh, is different in every region of every part of Serbia, but never mind that. What is important is that this, Bread is eaten on the morning, the Christmas morning. And inside of the bread, there are tiny um, presents. Let's say like, um, like a, one grain of corn or a bit of wheat or uh, some healthy herbs or a, a little coin. So there are, inside of the bread, there are as many tiny, tiny gifts as there are the members of the family. So before we start our meal on Christmas morning, we all turn the bread, like turn it three times, that's tradition in Serbia, three times, and then we break the bread. And every family member should, in the part of the bread they broke, get a gift. And every gift symbolizes something different in the upcoming year. So for example, if you got the tiny, tiny penny, you will be rich. If you got the healthy herb, you will be healthy. If you got the corn, you will be good at school or something like that. Every, every tiny gift has some symbolism. And yes, this bread is only, only eaten on Christmas and is traditionally made by the lady of the house in the morning. I also know how to make chesnitsa. Of course, nowadays, people who are busy, they also buy their bread, but usually it's traditionally made 
on the morning. Now, the next thing I would like to mention is something that is very, very specific. It's Serbian Patron Saint Day. And this holiday only exists in Serbia. So as I said, we are Orthodox Christians in Serbia, most of the population. And some other Orthodox Christian countries are like Armenia and uh, Russia and uh, Romania also. But Slava only exists in Serbia. Other Orthodox Christian countries do not have um, do not have this the special holiday. They have some others, but Slava is unique only for Serbia, and it's a church holiday. Since I started talking about church, obviously it's it's a church holiday, and as something really unique, uh, it also belongs to UNESCO Intangible World Heritage List of. Uh, from Serbia. It's, I think it was the first one that was inscribed there in 2014. So what is Slava? Uh, in Serbia, every, um, as I said, we look at the old church calendar, every country, uh, pardon me, every family has, is believed to have their saint protector. So on the day of the saint protector, that family celebrates that saint. I will tell you how important this day is. I mean, I can say it's like a, a birthday of a family, but it's really not that. It's the day when we celebrate the saints. The, we look at the church calendar and on the, on the day of our saint, we, we have our slava. Um, we say thank you for, we pray. We say thank you for protecting us until now. Please take care of our family in the following year. But what I wanted to say, uh, how important slava is, um, it's up to that point that like work employed people don't go to work on that day. They're allowed not to go to work and kids are allowed not to go to school on that day. So it's really a big, big, big celebration. As you can see here in the picture, no matter what happens on Slava Day, there are three things that need to be present. Uh, of course, as I said, bread is staple food in Serbia. So there is a special bread that we make only for Slava. And it is this beautiful bread here. It's called Slavski Kolac. So in the morning of Slava, the, again, usually the lady of the house would, would knead the bread, would bake this beautiful bread. Next thing, and this bread symbolizes the body of Jesus. And then there has to be the wine, which symbolizes the blood of Jesus. And there has to be this, you see this small dish here that is called jito. It's like specially prepared sweet wheat. I believe that is wheat, yes. And uh, that is like the symbol of connecting with the ancestors. So these three have to be here. And as you can see, there is this big candle that we light and on the candle, there is a small image, like a small sticker image of the saint. The, which symbolizes that this uh, candle is lit for the same. So in the morning, the family gathers at the house. Some people also go to church, but some people do it. My family does it in the house. So that's how I'm presenting it. Um, we pray, we eat the bread, we drink the wine, we light the candle and we eat the, the wheat. And then in the afternoon, there is a big party. We invite all of our family, all of our friends to our house. So let's say the morning part of the day is a bit uh, more connected to the rituals within the family. And then in the afternoon and in the evening, you invite basically anyone you want. And there is like lots and lots of food, different traditional dishes. It's like, as I said, a big, big party. Now, continuing to uh, the talk about respecting the ancestors, uh, on the left, we can see uh, Zadushnice, which can be translated as All Souls Day, when we go to visit the graves of our, of our ancestors. And on the right is the Korean Tongmyo, I believe. I hope I pronounced that well. As you can see, it's a very, very similar thing that we do. We bring flowers, we say thanks, we pray for our ancestors, we remember them. The only thing that I would say is different is the basic cultural difference of um, the fact that in Serbia, we do not bow. So as the picture shows here, um, you know, you go to bow to your ancestors, but since we don't have the culture of bowing, we just 
go and pray and think of the ancestors. But yes, this is another interesting similarity that I found. Now, I don't think I have a lot of time left, so I will speed up a bit now. I got very, very detailed on some of the things before. Talking about language, um, in Serbian, we actually, in Serbia, we are using uh, two different alphabets. One is the official one, which is Azbuka, Cyrillic alphabet. If you look at it, the first thing you will think is, oh my God, this looks like Russian but it's not Russian. It is very, very similar, but we have some different letters, so it's not the same. I will talk about that in a minute. And the other alphabet, the Latin alphabet that we're using is Abeceda. If you look at Abeceda, you will think, oh my god, this looks like English. Yes, it does look like English, but you will also notice that there are some different letters that are only Serbian, <laughs> Serbian letters around here. You can see them in the middle. I don't know. You probably can't see my pointer anyway here. So yes, we are using both. The official one is uh, Azbuka and uh, the kids we use, uh, we learn both of them at school, but this is not all. So we have like these two alphabets, these letters that you see, but both of the alphabets also have the cursive version which we have to, like, you know, cursive letters, which we have to learn separately. So usually people ask me, so how do you learn both alphabets at school? So the first one that is taught is the azbuka, obviously, then abeceda, then cursive azbuka, then cursive abeceda. That's as far as I remember it back in the days. Now, two people that I would like to mention comparing contrast now are the two makers of the language. I don't know how to, how else to um, to refer to, to them. On the left is Vuk Stefanovic Karadzic, whom I like to say is uh, Serbia's King Sejong, because as we all know, King Sejong uh, is the one who made Hunger with the idea, Hangul, Korean alphabet, with the idea of helping people read and write more easily, which is exactly the same thing that our King Sejong, who Stefanovic Karadzic did. He was not a king, he was a scholar, but he had, I believe, the same idea as um, King Sejong did, and that is that the official language that was in use at that time was really, really far from what the language that people were using. And in the case of Korea, the Chinese characters were very, um, very complicated to use, so King Sejong made hunger, but it was the same, uh, exactly the same in uh, in Serbia. Vukarajic thought that the official language is way too complicated, that people um, are not literate, can't read and write because there is no, the, there is no correct and appropriate Serbian alphabet for the language that Serbian people are speaking. So. He said this very, very famous thing, write as you speak and read as it's written. And he made the Serbian alphabet. He made it the Azbuka as it is today. He did look at the Russian alphabet as let's say basis or inspiration, but he removed the unnecessary letters and only put in the letters that were fit for the Serbian language. So. In case you, you never probably thought about it, but yes, Serbia has a very, very similar person to uh, King Sejong in Korea. One more thing that I would like to mention as someone who, um, who has actually studied languages most of, of her life, me, I started specializing in languages since high school. Uh, I believe that... Um, not I believe, I've learned, and it's, it's really like that, that looking at the language, looking at the words in the language, you can learn a lot about the culture of a country, meaning what I wanted to say is, for example, in Korea, family is very important, and family relations are very important, and we can see that through having so many different words for family relations, right? Different word for I'm not even sure about all of them. They're here in the picture, but the just remembering all of the words for family relations in Korean immediately reminded me that in Serbia it's exactly the same. So what I wanted to say through this um, through this comparison is that I believe um, 
some sentiment of Serbian and Korean people deeply is really similar. Family is something that's really respected, which is shown through this wide variety, this amazingly many words for family connections. That shows how much both Serbian and Korean people respect those connections, how it's important that, I mean, again, I'm not saying anything against any language, but um, when I want to translate some of my family connections to English, I just have to say cousin, like first cousin, second cousin, but in Serbian and in uh, Korean, those are absolutely different words. So that's uh, another thing that is not obvious because if I would say, oh my God, Serbian and Korean are so similar. No, they're not. Grammar wise, speaking pronunciation, there is nothing similar, but looking at the vocabulary, looking at what the, yes, the focus of the vocabulary is, uh, I would say that Serbian and Korean are similar. Okay, finally, we're coming to everyday life. Yes, this is the last part, and I did speed up a bit. Now, let's compare and contrast. There are way more things that I would like to talk about, but first thing, if my PPT decides to work, I don't know why it's not working, my PPT. Okay, this was supposed to come in order, but never mind. First one, taking off shoes in the home. Yes, sometimes my Korean friends, uh, I'm saying yes, that's similar in Korea and in Serbia. Sometimes when um, my Korean friends hear that this culture is the same, they're very surprised. But yes, we also do take off shoes before we come into the house. I mean, my mother would absolutely murder me if I just tried to walk within the house with my shoes. So yes, that is something that's similar in Korea and Serbia. One thing that is different that I am absolutely shocked by every, every winter in Korea is when I see young people, especially with bare feet outside in winter. Again, in Serbia, we have something like we have a saying that the boot is what keeps you warm. So especially we believe that like the heat you, yes, would escape right down through your feet. So especially in winter, your feet, like your, you don't need to have a huge, like a thick coat or, or a hat or something, but your feet need to be warm. And so when I see, yes, people bare feet outside, I mean, by bare feet, I mean, just wearing slippers without socks in Korea in winter, I get absolutely shocked. Now, when I said next thing here, relieving stress with music, I was thinking about Norebang because I also, when I came to Korea, I relieved my stress by going to Norebang to karaoke singing rooms, right? Uh, that is something that I believe every Korean person can relate to. But what is very similar in Serbia, I'm pretty sure that the picture won't come up. Never mind. I had a picture of um, of people having fun at a local local restaurant. Uh, Serbian people also love to sing and dance. And even though we do not have something like uh, Norepan, but wherever we like go out to eat or drink or something, we sing and dance a lot. And there is the culture of Kafana, which is like a traditional tavern in Serbia where, uh, you know, there's food and drinks and music and that is really <laughs> a well known way of relieving stress. So even though it's not the same as Norebang, it's uh, very a very similar culture and very, very similar means. Finally, two things that are absolutely different when it comes to Serbia and Korea. The first one is Bali Bali culture in Korea, which for those who don't speak Korean means fast, fast, everything is done so fast. That is something very unique <laughs> for Korea. There's not nothing similar to that in Serbia and in direct connection to that, the delivery services. The delivery services in Korea work so fast. Like I order something today and it arrives the next day or the same day. There is just nothing like that in Serbia. And I usually jokingly think and say that if I know, apart from food, apart from friends, from everything, everything that I would miss from Korea, 
I would also miss the fast delivery service because I don't know in Serbia if you like even send a letter or something to a city that's as far as I don't know Guangzhou Suncheon or something like that it will arrive in a week or two. So I remember once in my language school, my teacher asked me, so how do you send food in Serbia by post? And I was like, teacher, we don't send it because by the time it arrives, it would already have gone bad. <laughs> so yes, this was a bit of a joke. Obviously there are not so much of a joke actually. <laughs> so there are many, many more similarities and differences when it comes to everyday life, but I would like to end it here. and. Finally, once again, say why uh, I decided to talk about this today and why I believe that a closing of that connecting cultures is not something wow and not something that should be done only at like specific cultural exchange events. Uh, I had I was asked once when I was in Korea, when do you feel most warm when you're in Korea? And I really deeply thought about that. And my answer was when I talk about my country, because when I'm in Korea, my country and everything about my country is so far from here. And whenever people ask me something about Serbia, I feel very happy to share, happy to talk about it. Because when I'm in Korea with no, let's say, no other Serbian people around me, I am the one presenting Serbia, really. But also after being in Korea for, for four years and when I go to Serbia, if there's no other Korean person next to me, in Serbia, I'm the one presenting Korea because in Serbia, people ask me about Korea and I talk about Korea. So I really think that there is this cliche word that cliche phrase that everyone says, you know, I want to be the bridge connecting cultures, but as cliche edited as it is, it's really true. One person, not just me, anyone, any person who's going between cultures or living somewhere abroad or just visiting or traveling a lot can become that bridge because it's really not something fantastic and fabulous. It's just talking about the differences and similarities, just as I did today, just as I do probably on a daily basis while living in Korea. You see something, you notice something when you are in another country and say, oh, so it's like this here. And oh, it's different in my country. Or, oh, it's the same in my country. So it's really not that difficult to try to find those similarities and to try to understand the differences. So of course I'm very happy and honored to be able to, to do this talk and maybe talk a bit more, not maybe for sure, I did talk a bit more about Serbia because there are way more uh, uh, listeners here today from Korea because I wanted to present my country as well, but not only through events and talks and presentations like this. Every day I learn something new from my Korean friends, from my Korean coworkers, from my foreign friends, my foreign coworkers, and I also share something about my country. So I believe that connecting cultures and discovering similarities and differences is something that we should do just like that on a daily basis to be able to learn more from each other and understand each other more. That is it. So usually I would <laughs> come up now because usually as a host, I only come up in the Q&A session, but since I'm talking to myself today, I would like to see first if there are any um, questions in the chat room or if you would like to ask me something in person, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you can unmute yourself and just ask me. Okay, I am reading now. Okay. Do we have any questions here? Okay, we have wonderful presentation from Mabul Hake. Thank you. We have a message at weddings we like to dance from, yes, I will say honestly, that's my sister. Hello, my sister. At weddings we like to dance, we do. Uh, sound was good. 
Okay, we have another message here from um, my lovely Romanian colleague saying, interesting, in Romania, there are 95% Christian Orthodox, but we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Yes, that is something very, very unique for Romanians then. I hope we will, we will hear... Um, I hope you will hear a presentation about Romania soon as well. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions? If not, I of course did receive some questions uh, beforehand in the, in the question form. So I don't know if I should answer those now, or if not, I also, because this time I am, I am the host and the speaker, I prepared questions for you. So unless you want me to ask you, please ask me. Because yes, I prepared questions for, for all of the listeners today. Until we don't have a lot of time left, actually. Okay, let's see, chatting. Uh, how is the memory of Yugoslavia by, uh, by Dr. Shin for the general public? Well, I would have to say that it's uh, divided. It's really divided uh, about the President Tito as well and about the, the life back then. Uh, there are many people who talk about Yugoslavia with nostalgia, who keep saying that life was way better then. And obviously those are the people who, who did live through that time. I cannot say from my personal experience because I was born after, um, after the Yugoslavia um, after Yugoslavia fell apart, but definitely it's divided. There are those who are angry about what was happening at that time, and there are those who are still missing it and who would, if possible, like to get back Yugoslavia immediately this, this very moment. But um, at the time when uh, this, I only heard stories about this, but um, how much Tito, President Tito was liked at that time, that was, uh, that's not even the question, how much he was liked at the time before all the other things were happening and before this all could have been uh, put in perspective. Okay, now I hope this answers the question well, because I, I personally cannot really compare and contrast that, that part. Yes, Dr. Shin says, thank you. Next question is by my sister, Anya. She says, are the phrases similar like plunuti otas? Yes, this is a phrase in Serbian that uh, means same as your father. Uh, actually, I don't know. Is there a specific phrase? Maybe some Korean listeners can help me. Is there a specific phrase to say that you look exactly like your father? That one, I don't know. I'm sorry, Anya. I will look it up and <laughs> let you know later. And we have another question, which will probably be the last one since the time is running out. How to introduce Korean traditional culture in Bangladesh? How to develop partnership with GIC? Well, how to introduce a traditional culture in Bangladesh? As I said, like you can start with making some first I guess you should start by introducing it slowly, making some smaller events, but partnership with GIC, mm, I'm not sure if it's possible, but I can ask. <laughs> I mean, GIC is there, as Punkto International Center, is there to connect with um, many, uh, many countries abroad. So I'm pretty sure something can be done about it actually. I mean, I can advertise as well while I'm here. We had many exchange programs for young people recently, and um, maybe next time I can let you know to specifically tell to some friends in Bangladesh if you have, uh, because there are many. Oh yes, so this is <laughs> this is. <laughs> Uh, this is a good uh, suggestion by my dear colleague, do a, GIC, do a GIC talk related to Bangladesh. That is a good idea. We obviously accept talks on different topics, uh, but, mm -hmm. but um, what was I about to say? But yes, there are many, many uh, international programs that GIC organizes and a good bad thing and good thing at the same time is that due to Corona, most of them, nearly all of them, are only conducted online now. So um, next time, uh, 
you can follow our website and when there is like um, an international uh, exchange program in GIC, you can send it to the people you know in Bangladesh and again become the bridge connecting Bangladesh and South Korea. And uh, yes, okay, one more question. Just because I know you're my sister, uh, are the traditional clothing the same in Serbia and Korea? No, that's why I didn't include that. Very, very different, very different. Um, Serbian traditional clothing has, um, so we usually wear like a white shirt and then a black vest. And um, there is the, um, like, a, how do I call that? A belt, like very colorful belt. And girls wear a skirt and a skirt that has an apron over it. And the boys, um, the boys, the men, the male traditional clothing, of course, uh, they wear trousers and not the skirt. And the Korean hanbok, Korean traditional clothing is something very, very specific. So I think that when comparing that, I would say that it's very different. The only thing that I can say is similar is that Serbian traditional clothing for girls has like very colorful um, floral pattern. And sometimes, um, sometimes Hamburg has also like very colorful and beautiful pattern, but that's probably the only thing that that I can find that is similar. In, in its spaces, they are very, very different, Serbian and Korean traditional clothes, which is the reason why I didn't put them in this presentation. But thank you for your question, Anya. Um, Dr. Shin says, great to have you here, Anya. And I am really thankful for all the questions. Thank for, thankful for having you here today for your attention. Anya says, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Lots of fun. I hope everyone enjoyed it and I hope it wasn't too, um, I hope it wasn't too, let's say, monotone <laughs> having only, only me here without any other speakers today. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yes, you asked me just enough questions not to get me to ask questions to you. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, there's me again. Maybe you could see me through, throughout this whole time, depending how you put your, um, your settings on Zoom. Thank you once again. Before I finally say goodbye to all of you, as always, I would love to introduce... Oh, okay. Uh, Mabul raised the hand. Do we have time? Okay. What would you like to say? Thank you very much. Uh, this is. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I can't hear you. Can you okay. say again, please? Can you hear? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, uh, this is Mahabul Hak from Bangladesh. Nice. Last time I attended uh, Gondu International Center, GI Sitak, Delhi. Um, and I am very much glad to see uh, and learn from your nice presentation. Really, this is wonderful. Uh, I visited Gwangju. Really, Gwangju people also very much friendly, and uh, I love Gwangju. I attend Gwangju traditional culture uh, in Gwangju during the celebration of May 18, uh, you know, democratic uprising in Gwangju. Uh, mm -hmm. Hosted by the May 18 Memorial Foundation. Mm -hmm. Really, see. this was a great and uh, wonderful session, but uh, we have learned new knowledge from this. Uh, after my visit, I introduced in here with our young people. Mm -hmm. We developed a short team. They judge uh, Gonju uh, food like kimchi. They, they, uh, love Gonju food, uh, Korean food, really good. Uh, and uh, Korean movie also famous for our uh, young people in here because uh, sound and also video direction and history, uh, everything is good. Uh, my, after visit my 
this is from Korea. I have decided uh, we have introduced a um, Korean and like you know, language, Korean culture, holistic approach, Korean language, traditional culture. Uh, we have developed a center in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Our uh, team, our organization <laughs> practicing uh, and uh, they learn from online about Korean language and uh, Korean culture. Um, I, uh, last time uh, I also uh, talk with some Korean friends how to develop um, Korean culture in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also developed Bangladesh Korean Friendship Center in Bangladesh, uh, small funded by the um, May 18 Memorial Foundation uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, uh, my question here, uh, how to develop um, uh, Korean uh, language center and also Korean cultural, traditional culture, uh, how to introduce uh, in Bangladesh uh, and uh, uh, how to develop um, partnership with uh, uh, Gwangju International Center or Gwangju Metropolitan City regarding the uh, collaboration uh, to promote and uh, to promote the uh, Gwangju traditional culture uh, and also um, Gwangju art uh, mm. in Bangladesh. Uh, <laughs> As I said, I would like to, to say this again, definitely you should start with like smaller steps participating in many of the international exchanges, like transfer it to the people in your country, these exchanges, and also join in as many of the projects that we have. I really do not have time to, to talk about all of them now, but definitely go to our website see everything that we are doing and then if you see something suitable you can for sure join and that will be probably it won't be like the the whole big um you know the it won't result in something huge i uh, guess you can see in the chat room our website it won't result in something huge immediately but taking those small steps and yes even uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned maybe writing for Guangzhou news or uh, participating in a gic talk as you are right now those are all small steps but definitely please do check our website and thank you for your Thank you for your comment and thank you for your participation. And I'm really sorry to say that we definitely have to. No, really, really. Talk now. One thing that I, uh, we can change young people in accents regarding their uh, internship and also mm -hmm. uh, exhibi exhibition in Gonzo Center or also Bangladesh traditional culture. Also, we can accents. Uh, Korean traditional culture, uh, we show in Bangladesh and Bangladesh traditional culture we can introduce in uh, going to the Gwangju International Center. Yes, yes there are many options. Uh, <laughs> many options. Many options for sure. Please do visit our website. As I said, I can't introduce all of them now, but I'm sure you will find something that is appropriate for your vision and I will be cheering for your vision as I am as you could hear in my today's talk, all about um, connecting cultures. Oh, yeah, you will be happy to know that uh, my organization, Bangladesh Center for Human Rights and Development, has developed partnership with uh, Gwangju Peace, uh, Gwangju Human Rights and Peace Foundation. Oh, that's very important. Last, that's very last important. couple of years, last couple of years, we have been working with them. You could make a GIC talk about that if you would like. Thank you very much. Thank Once you. again, thank you, uh, Mr. Mabu. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your day to be with us. Uh, I wish you all a lovely rest of the day, lovely rest of the weekend, and the following week until we meet again on next Saturday. Same time, same place for next week's GIC talk, which is something that you are expecting always 
Donna Hunt's special workshop, Let's Agree to Disagree, our monthly workshop. Have you noticed that there are particular topics that everyone tries to avoid so that nobody argues or leaves the room? You are invited to bring those controversial opinions into the spaces of empathic listening circles so that all of us learn how to listen and be heard. So if you are interested in this uh, monthly workshop that lovely Danahan from Belarus has every, um, every month as her GIC talk, please do join us next week as well. Thank you for your attention. Have a good day and I will see you again next Saturday. Goodbye.